Thanks for joining us today. I'm Mike and Kate, and I lead NASA's efforts to engage students in our mission. And I'm really excited to be here and to introduce you to the astronauts we're going to see today. And I'm Andy Aldrin. I'm president of the Aldrin Family Foundation. And today we're going to talk about the connections between space and education. And spoiler alert, it's, it's all about you out there, the teachers and the parents. So today we're going to hear from three astronauts, Tracy Caldwell Dyson, Bonnie Dunbar, and Nancy Curry Gregg. with our first memory of space, the first time space really inspired us. Now, for me, it was a little bit different because, well, I kind of grew up with space all the time. It came home every night with my dad. In fact, I could literally jump over my back fence into Alan Bean's backyard. So it was just, it was kind of there everywhere all the time. But Bonnie, you know, I know you grew up in a very different yeah. environment. I think you're out in the eastern part of Washington state. What was the first time that space really inspired you? I can actually remember that. I had been reading since a very early age because we didn't have TV, reading about space. And then we walked out in that October day when Sputnik uh, night, when Sputnik was launched and I could see all the stars in the Milky Way and uh, this small orb circling the earth. And I felt, uh, I hate to use the word out of body, but there's depth to looking at the universe. And I had no logical reason for thinking this, but I said, that's where I want to be. This is where I'm going to point my life. And uh, that has been with me since I was eight years old. You know, I think if you were to ask my mom when my aha moment was, it was in her womb because uh, sitting there watching the, uh, uh, the first landing on the moon, uh, she was a month away from delivering me, and she'd say that I was thinking about it then. But, uh, you know, like uh, Bonnie had said, you know, you walk outside, and uh, I lived in the deserts of Southern California, and going out there every night to see the, the stars, it was um, a, an explosion of Milky Way every time. And so there's uh, um, the start of uh, me looking into the heavens and, and uh, wondering what it was like uh, to be there. It wasn't until I got uh, into high school and uh, about to apply for college when I started to think about what I want to do the rest of my life. And I wouldn't say it was very straightforward, uh, but um, it was uh, inspired by the teachers around me uh, that led me to think about becoming an astronaut. Oh, actually, I was only 10 years old um, during the first moon landing, and I remember rushing home from a swim meet with all my friends and my parents and sitting around a very small black and white television set. And the thing that struck me, and I think that was life-changing, was the sense of pride in our nation of this great engineering and scientific accomplishment. And it, and it wasn't just the two individuals, two very brave individuals who stepped foot on the moon. But it was that, that national accomplishment. And from that point on, I knew I wanted to be a part of that. So Mike, we've talked a little bit about, you know, initial inspiration of space and about the past in space. Why don't you tell us what's going on with NASA today to inspire kids? So, you know, I love hearing these stories about how people were inspired and how space really changed their life. And in these cases, they changed their career trajectories. And I think as we look at the current students today, it's important just to pause for a second and hear about what is NASA doing today when it comes to space and to space exploration. 50 years ago, 
We went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers, this time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. So, so Tracy, we just watched that video where we get a chance to see what is America doing when it comes to sending humans back to the moon, in this case, the first woman to the moon. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit from your vantage point as one of our current astronauts. What do you think about Artemis and, and your role within it? Um, I think I speak on behalf of everyone currently in the core that this is an exciting time that we are in and uh, the chance to go back to the moon and uh, honor and further the work that our Apollo astronauts and our team did back then is um, an amazing opportunity to be a part of the program today. And um, we're uh, excited about uh, all the preparation that is going into place as well as the enthusiasm all around the country uh, for um, the goal we have of getting back to the moon. Bonnie, what are your thoughts as we look at, as we look at going back to the moon? Well, I'm very excited about it. Um, you know, I, m my interest in the moon actually started in books. We didn't have a TV growing up. I guess you could call me kind of the, the old astronaut on this panel. Uh, but I was reading Jules Byrne and H.G. Wells, and, and so the Apollo program was just a, kind of the culmination of all of that that I'd been reading about. And then I had a teacher who uh, read to us from a book, uh, it was a fiction book actually, about exploration of Mars. So when we did finally get a TV and I was watching Flash Gordon and watching us go to space, my dream was to eventually explore the universe. So I'm so, so thrilled that we're going back to the moon and then I hope on to Mars. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks for those comments. Nancy, what are your thoughts as it looks like if we send the uh, humans back to the, to the surface of the moon? Yeah, sure, Mike. It's a great question. Um, I absolutely know what impact the Apollo program had on me. I mean, the Apollo program, quite frankly, inspired me um, for the career that I have had. And, and so I think I see that same thing in Artemis, that inspiration of a new generation and a new generation of explorers and scientists and engineers that instill that national pride that we're going back to the moon. We're going to put the first woman uh, on the surface of the moon. We're going to go beyond. We're going to use that as a stepping stone. And it's been a long time since we've had that. And, and so I think that igniting uh, in this new generation that they can be a part of this really exciting program of human spaceflight is critically important. All right, well, now I've had a chance to talk about what NASA is going. And I think as you look at this country and you look at the, the challenges we face as, as, uh, uh, as America, we're looking at how do we encourage kids to be part of uh, STEM and STEM and, and studies and STEM engagement. And I think it'd be a good just to pause and think about um, how we're currently structured. And I want to start this first question with Bonnie. You know, Bonnie, after you were an accomplished astronaut, you went off and you were the, the, the president and CEO of the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. So you had a firsthand chance to see how students are impacted. And then, of course, now you're at Texas a and University where you continue to teach students. Can you talk a little bit about the role of how you've seen space and innovative learning that, learning that we've been able to talk to students about? Well, I think it goes back to that word called inspire. You know, students don't know what STEM needs. We made that up at NASA and the National Science Foundation as an acronym. But just like Tracy and Nancy were inspired and I was inspired, you've got to catch the imagination of kids. And what we learned at the Museum of Flight and what my sister learned as a K-12 teacher is you got to expose kids to ex exciting things. And space is one of them. And they can go off into many different directions. But once they're hooked, you don't need to worry about motivating them. They'll be self-motivated to learn, whether it's mathematics or science. So 
really goes back to that inspiration. We have to expose them. I really think the two most important facets um, of preparing children to eventually be space explorers are two things. One is problem solving uh, and the other is teamwork. Um, problem solving, I say, because despite um, what if in every possible scenario we could ever find ourselves getting into on a space mission, we always encounter the unexpected. And, and to, to have that ingenuity, to have that creative problem solving capability is really imperative. Not just when you're on the surface of the Mar or Mars or on the moon, um, but in an engineering or scientific environment as well. And then teamwork. Um, I always tell my students at all levels that uh, the world's problems are so complex it will never be solved by one person. They will be solved by large multidisciplinary teams. So understanding how to work in those environments, understanding how to value somebody else's perspective is, is critically important. Tracy, you've had a chance to be on Sports Space Station and talk to kids in all kinds of different ways. Do you have any thoughts about how we inspire and how we reach kids in this current environment? You know, I have to say um, one word comes to mind, and that's curiosity. We have to not only tap into their curiosity, but uh, help them recognize it, that um, asking questions is being curious. It's uh, not showing that you don't know something. It's uh, showing that you're thinking and that you got questions, I mean, that you're curious. And so I think, um, especially coming from a science background, uh, it was curiosity that led me into science. It wasn't because I, I thought I was smart enough to do it. So uh, I think in a word, it's curiosity. We have to tap into that. So, so Mike, what is NASA doing? What are, your, what are your priorities in trying to engage students? And I think more importantly, engaging teachers yeah. Hey, Andy, thanks for the question. So three points. You know, we're really trying to engage students in the work that NASA is doing, and whether that's helping us contribute to real life problems that NASA has, or whether it's developing a future diverse STEM workforce, or providing these authentic learning experiences. Those really drive home the work that we do at NASA. And I would say for people listening today, I'd say there's three ways that I would love for you to be able to participate and join us in that effort. First, I would love for you to go visit stem.nasa.gov. It's a website that we've created in the last two years that tries to bring together all the different resources NASA has with education in a way that educators can find it, and students and parents for that matter. And so you can go in there and find out where it's, uh, what, what interests you and, and how we can help you with that. The second thing is I hope that you sign up for NASA Express. It's a weekly email comes out every Thursday. NASA Express comes in your inbox with all the different things that NASA is doing over the next couple of weeks. And the third thing, I just have to say, I hope that you'll follow us on social media and that for the people who are watching this far into the show, you are space cadets. I mean that with all sincerity. You are on board with the work that we do. But you probably have colleagues and other parents or other educators who may not have this level of detail. So if you find us on social media or NASA Express and you share that with others, I think it's a great opportunity for us to use this mission to inspire kids of all ages. Thanks, Andy. It's my pleasure. So, you know, the real connection between space and students are the teachers, the educators. Um, you know, I think it's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about what we can do to support the educators and what educators, you know, frankly, have done for all of us. You know, I found, regardless of whether you're in sixth grade, in high school, or a graduate student, uh, the more you can have practical application and hands-on material for the students, it solidifies the entire learning experience. I'm a huge proponent of active learning uh, in every single lecture session I do, uh, undergraduate, graduate students, when I go into elementary schools, I try to give them hands-on activities and again, intentionally put them in teams, put them into a, a scenario where they have to solve a problem. You know, I always tell them that no one in your life, other than maybe a teacher in a classroom, will walk in and say, A equals this, B equals this, tell me what C is, I'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, it's all about framing real world problems and coming up with those solutions to those problems. I was at the Museum of Flight, and NASA does this, is you have to involve the teachers in the programs as well. Uh, and we live in a time when there are fewer and fewer math and science teachers available. Uh, some states are recruiting them preferentially just to be able to teach those classes. So involving them in our programs, whether it be at NASA or at the museum, is incredibly important. 
and then involving the parents. We live in a tremendously complex age of computers and GPS and, and handheld devices. And we have uh, maybe left some of our generations behind in that. So we need to bring the parents along as well and help them understand how important science and math is to the education of, of their children. And I think NASA does a wonderful job of that and reaching out to the, to the informal education community. And Tracy can talk about this, but one of the missions of the astronauts has been since I arrived in 1980 as an astronaut was outreach to schools and how important that is. Absolutely. I think that um, think along with the teachers and the parents that um, the community, I mean, it takes a community to, uh, to raise kids and it doesn't just happen in villages, it happens in cities and across the world and with the internet and social media and the platforms that we have to reach around the world our kids can tap into uh, work that's being done halfway around the globe. Um, I think that, like you said earlier, Bonnie, that the um, hands-on is some of the most important uh, parts of learning. And for myself, I can speak uh, to the fact I was better in a laboratory than I was sitting in a classroom uh, listening to a lecture. Sure. My father, and talk about parents getting involved, I think parents just loving their kids and supporting them and telling them uh, they can do it is, um, is, is a step in the right direction. But I even worked with my father and some of the things my father taught me, I actually employed on the space station more than I did some of the science that I did, <laughs> believe it or not. And so I think parents, parents have a lot to offer uh, their kids in just uh, being an example setter, if not a demonstrator. Of, of skills that build confidence. And I just see um, the education of a student, be it STEM or other fields, really um, is a community effort. And that community now is so much more global than it's ever been. Yeah, and I think teachers need to be reminded of that. I think sometimes they get a little frustrated, and especially now. You know, I'm homeschooling my, my third grade granddaughter, and, you know, she's one of the few that ties into their, they're doing Zoom with third graders. Um, and so there's just a few that are tying in, and, and one may be because some of them may not have the technology at home or, or the bandwidth at home or parents that understand the technologies. Um, and so I, I think... Uh, I, I know how excited my own granddaughter gets when she talks to her teacher every morning, uh, and it really means it really means the whole world to them. So I think they need to hear that message now. I really do, especially now. And let's say parents uh, can directly or indirectly influence their kids in uh, science, technology, and curiosity. I, I'm the first generation college uh, student out of my family. My parents were homesteaders. But I consider my father and mother some of the most creative inventors because we didn't have a Home Depot down the road. We, we fixed everything and invented everything. I learned to weld when I was a kid. And uh, I think that attitude they gave me that there was nothing that was impossible, that you should at least try it is something I brought through my life as well. You know, I, I just have to say, Andy, I think you need to speak here because uh, all of us have different parents who have encouraged us, and you have a very unique one. You know, um, yeah, Dad taught in subtle ways. I didn't realize that, you know, when I got for, I don't know, my sixth or seventh birthday, one of those hanging trapeze sort of things that demonstrates Newton's fourth law, I had no idea that that's what I was learning. <laughs> I, I had no idea what I was learning. You know, I remember once he, we were driving with helium balloons and, and he wanted to make sure that everybody paid attention to what happens to a helium balloon when you stop the car, All right, The balloon goes to the back of the car, not the front. And so, yeah, there were, there were always lessons that were kind of there in everything and, you know, as we both grew up, because he was still pretty much a kid, um, we just literally talked about space all of the time, everywhere. So, yeah, it was a constant education. So, you know, th your question was, I think, a good segue. Can you talk a little bit about how the Aldrin Family Foundation is working today in, in space programming and helping kids? Yeah, Mike, I'd be happy to. So, you know, we've been talking a lot in this conversation today about words like teamwork, like inspiration, curiosity, all the things that come from space. And I've been loving it because that's really 
um, kind of the core of what we're doing. We're bringing the inspiration of space into the classroom in ways that really excite students. And so, you know, one of the things that we do is we've got these 25 foot Mars maps and moon maps and, and we put kids on these maps and, and, we, and we let them create their own sort of version of what it would be like to live on Mars and it offers teachers a great opportunity to create a number of just wonderful lessons and so I think we're seeing a lot of real results as we're measuring what's coming out of it um, you know looking at real efficacy um, so we get really excited about that there are some other things that we're doing that are, that I think really bring the excitement of space not just into the stem education but we're working with the public consulting group now to to write educational curricula for things like English language skills that actually bring the great stories of space into the classroom and let kids kind of see the excitement of space, you know, in terms of storytelling and understanding how to communicate and understanding how to operate as teams. And so, you know, we see that, that the possibility of bringing space into the classroom, you know, is almost limitless. Left off with the clock is started. Zero G and they feel fine. American heroes. Oh, in Houston, you are go for staging. One giant leap for mankind. Every one of their stories began here, in the classroom. I want to learn about space because I want to know more to be the first person on Mars. Now that I know I can actually be like the first person on Mars, I really want to go. That's why you'll also find the Aldrin Family Foundation in classrooms. The fundamental strategy of the Aldrin Family Foundation is to start broadly and inspire literally hundreds of thousands of kids. The AFF is on a mission to inspire the world through the Aldrin Space Institute and the Share Space Foundation. The Aldrin Space Institute for older students and Share Space for ones in K through 12. Share Space provides unique tools to advance STEAM education science, technology, engineering, arts and math. It provides educators with Mars books, lesson plans, robots, and a giant Mars map. It's larger than life, so it's not just a tiny little postcard, but it's 25 feet of Mars. Well, my favorite part about the map is kind of like seeing all these rovers and seeing all the places that I've never knew about on Mars. In the past year, ShareSpace placed over 100 map kits across America and the globe. Children, all, especially the campers, learn uh, in a much more tactile way, so having something that they can crawl around on and touch and grab really helps them grasp the idea of things. The purpose of the foundation is really to create the next generation of space leaders, entrepreneurs. How long does it take to get to Mars? To create those game changers of tomorrow, it will take the support of heroes like you. So you know we've been talking about the role of parents and I think that's so critical right now when you think of, as we're taping this, we're all in our individual houses because of COVID-19. But you can't, you can't, ex uh, there's no way to get around the fact that educators play such an important role. And I know as I watch my own daughter, there's things that I might say five times, um, and she, then she comes home and says, well, guess what, Mrs. So-and-so said such and such. I mean, it's amazing the role that educators have played. And I, I'd love to ask our panelists, what's an edu what, can you think of an educator that has really made a difference in your, in your past, and why was, that, why was their, inter their intervention so important to you? Well, I remember all of my teachers that made a difference, and uh, I know in, we like to have the sense that somehow back when I was going through school in the 50s and 60s that girls weren't encouraged into math and science, but in the rural area of Washington State that simply wasn't true. Uh, when I first articulated that I wanted to be an astronaut to my fifth grade teacher, he actually didn't laugh at me. <laughs> Uh, encouraged me to read uh, some books. Uh, we, we didn't have a big library, uh, but I did read those books. And then I went on to, as I graduated from eighth grade, and we actually had an eighth grade graduation ceremony for 22 kids, <laughs> uh, and had to go to a high school. Uh, he asked me what I was going to take as electives, and I didn't know what an elective was. We just, you know, you went to school, you, did, you, t you studied what the teacher gave you. And I, I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, if you want to be an astronaut, you should take algebra. 
And I said, what's that? And he said, trust me. And I did. And of course, that was the pathway, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, math analysis, and I took biology, chemistry, and physics. And it was my physics teacher my senior year uh, because uh, applying to colleges was a, a new venture for us. But I finally was accepted to the University of Washington under the National Defense Education Act, or I wouldn't have been at college. I was working in the fields in the summer. And I took all this paperwork into Mr. Anderson, my physics teacher, and I said, well, what college should I select? And was, I thought I was going to college, and here it had all these colleges, like business and law. And he looked down the list and he said, Bonnie, I think you should become an engineer. And, and we checked that block and he changed my whole life. So in the fall of 1967, I entered engineering and um, that was exactly the right place for me and that's how I became an astronaut. Teachers made a difference. Tracy, how about you? Um, I mean, like, like Bonnie, I, I came from, uh, I was a first generation college student and, and my story getting into the, you know, to, to NASA and in the astronaut corps involves a combination of teachers and my, and my parents. Um, I'm, I mean, I think everybody's, uh, everybody could say that, but uh, in particular, when I was uh, about to graduate, I was a junior in high school and, um, you know, you're uh, trying to decide if and where to go to college. I had absolutely no idea where to go and what to do. And I went to my parents and I said, I, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And so they asked me a, a series of questions that led me to think about what I enjoyed doing at that time in my grand 16 years of life. And they had me write a list and they said, um, just keep adding to this list and make sure that it's your list, the things that you enjoy doing, because whatever you do later on in life, you want to enjoy what you're doing and make sure that it's your list, not, not our list, not your sister's list, not your teacher's list, but your list. And you can add to it, you can take away from it, but always go back to that list and, and whatever you do later in life, make sure that it has those things. So on my list, I had things like um, work with tools because I did a lot of that with my dad. I liked um, science, so I didn't think I was very good at it. I liked languages. Um, I was taking Spanish at the time, I knew sign language, and I really enjoyed the culture um, learning about that as well as uh, learning about how to speak in their language and uh, so forth. And I also was an athlete and so I, I thought, I don't know that I want to be an Olympian, but anything I do later on in life, I want it to be involving um, being strong and, and fit. And uh, I had no idea after I looked at that list what I wanted to be. It still didn't jump out at me, but they said, put it away and, um, and just know that you can come back to it. Well, it happened to be the same year that uh, the, whole, the whole world was excited about something NASA was doing, and it was sending a teacher into space. It was 1986, and um, it was before the accident, but it was nonetheless um, a, huge, uh, a huge milestone in NASA's uh, history. And it was for the first time in my life I ever thought about being an astronaut. Um, I was like, a teacher, an astronaut? How is this? I thought they were all test pilots, and I didn't know any test pilots, but at that point in my life, I knew not only a, a few teachers, but teachers, I was with teachers more uh, in my life than I was my own parents. And I had not just one teacher, but I had six teachers. And my teachers didn't just teach me algebra and science and language. They were my coaches. They were my counselors. They were my, they, they formed me. And so I was like, wow, if a teacher can be an astronaut, I got to figure out what this, this is all about. And so then I started to look more into what NASA was doing, what astronauts were doing. They were building a space station. Back then it was called Freedom, but they, uh, you know, quickly transitioned to International Space Station. They were going to have to build the space station. And so I looked back at my list of all the things I had put on there and I was like, I think I know what I want to be. I want to be an astronaut. And so to, for me, it was a combination of effort of uh, teachers who had just done their job, not to mention the ones who took special um, attention to me for things I was doing, uh, but my parents who just so wisely guided me without forcing me in any one direction. And then for me going on to college, I never, I never thought possible. And I didn't, as I was going through college, think um, I got to do this because I want to be an astronaut. I just kept doing the things that I enjoyed doing. And chemistry wasn't one of those things that, that was the pathway necessarily. Uh, people said, you want to go into the military? I was like, but I, 
I don't. I want to be, I want to go into science. And so every time someone would say, you got to do this, I just kept falling back on the advice of my parents. And um, in the end, it, it kind of worked out. So. <laughs> I would say it more than kind of worked out, Tracy. I think that's, that's awesome. Nancy, you want to weigh in on that one? Um, for me, it was my high school math, biology, and chemistry teacher. Um, and when I launched into space for the first time in my very limited family area, those three teachers sat by my parents because they had such a critical role in putting me where I was. I, I have said many times I was carried to the launch pad on their shoulders, and I really mean that. Um, and so it, it were the, the teachers, and I think because someone like myself that was a first generation college student, it was even more critical. I didn't understand the opportunities that were out there. I didn't understand uh, even what, what was capable uh, in my future. And it was the teachers in my life that pointed me towards those opportunities and, and created the fundamentals uh, on which I built my entire career. You, we talked a lot about teachers and how they've inspired you. Um, Bonnie and Nancy, you both, I know, have a lot of experience on the other side of the rostrum, so to speak, teaching. You know, teaching is a very personal experience. Talk about times that you've been able to make a difference, you know, on an individual level where you've taken someone who, who may have a lot of talent, let's say, and has just somehow lost motivation. You know, for me, those are the most rewarding moments. Talk a little bit about it, what it means to be a teacher. Well, you know, I never thought I would have that opportunity to be a teacher. I, my career has uh, been industry and government and nonprofit, and I thought I was sort of past that point uh, until uh, a university came and recruited me and asked me to, to create a, a freshman class for mechanical engineers called Introduction to Engineering. And then I was recruited to A&M after that. And I'd have to think that one breakthrough moment came with my lead graduate student. Uh, at, in the beginning, you're sort of leading them, right? But you don't want to keep leading them. <laughs> you want them to suddenly lead themselves. And it was that moment when he said, you know, I, I, I got so interested in this topic last night that I lost track of time. And he was excited about what he found. And it was that moment I knew that he was, he was on his own path. I, that his curiosity and his ability to learn was going to take him uh, far down the road. And, and then that's proven true. He's a, a real star. So you hope you can always find more of those students, right? <laughs> right. And I mean, it's right. When they develop their own concepts, you know, students come to you first in graduate school and say, well, what do you want me to do? And I go, no, no. What do you want to do? Because if you're not passionate about it, you will not finish. You know, we spent some time talking today about how educators can make a difference and how we train things in classrooms. I'd like to pivot a little bit to talk about how does NASA train astronauts and how does NASA uh, prepare that team that it takes to, to, to launch Artemis and to launch the, the commercial crew program. Tracy, I know you've been an instructor astronaut where you've helped to train newest classes of astronauts. Can you talk a little bit about the role that, that you've played in that, in that process? Sure. Um, you know, I, uh, I think that going into the astronaut corps, I never even thought of, uh, I never fathomed uh, being an instructor in such a thing. But when you start gaining a lot of experience, uh, not just um, in space, because our missions are only a fraction of the time we spend being an astronaut, but all of the training and the development and, and just being a part of the um, the support on the ground, you, you gain a lot of insight that when people come in uh, new to the program, uh, don't, they're, they're drinking from a fire hose and, and aren't going to necessarily pick up on some of these other nuances. It's kind of like, um, you know, I've, I gathered like a professor is when they've got new graduate students that just, you, you've got this learning curve and it's nice to have somebody that has been there, done that to, to help keep you, you know, kind of course correct you um, as you, you take in so much information. So being an instructor astronaut uh, has been a real joy for me, not only from interacting with our new bright folks and how wide eyed they are, but also to be a part of changing our training so that it uh, more 
uh, facilitates learning and because we don't have a whole lot of time to train people and our situations change a lot so people have to be um, trained to a greater depth in a shorter period of time. It's been really rewarding to, to tap into um, the development of our training to see how we can help people learn more faster. And, and so that's been rewarding. But it, it really comes down to the people that we get to interact with, not just uh, in the astronaut corps, but also the team of instructors that we have around us and the phenomenal um, commitment in, um, in and amongst NASA and our partners uh, to this endeavor. And it's, um, it kind of lends itself to the whole team, team aspect as well. Um, but uh, I think being an astronaut instructor has uh, certainly um, helped me to give back a little bit of what's uh, been so generously given to me. There are a lot of teachers out there watching this program and a lot of them are trying to figure out, you know, okay, space is cool, but What's your message to them of how to bring space into the classroom? Oh, well, Tracy, you go first. You're doing it from the station. <laughs> That's pretty oh, well, cool. I think, I, think, <laughs> uh, I think Mike listed a bunch of, um, a, a bunch of avenues to tap into what NASA is doing. But uh, I mean, NASA is, we belong to the public. We belong to the country. And we're doing this mm. so that we can teach not just ourselves, but the, but the world of what's out there. And so there's no greater resource um, on the planet than to, to tap into NASA. And so I think um, from the tangible resources uh, to the um, tuning in to the latest um, launches and missions, um, manned and unmanned, and the future of where we're going is, um, you know, the, I think the greatest resource uh, that we have. And um, I think, to, to tune in now, and especially the, the kids that, that could be listening to this are, are gonna wanna pay attention because they are the ones who are going to be stepping foot on these planets that we are uh, planning to go to. I mean, people like me and Bonnie, we've, we've uh, had a lot of experience in low Earth orbit, and we have helped along with your dad, Andy, to, to lay the groundwork of what it is like and what it takes to work and do meaningful work in space. And it, um, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight, this learning, uh, but kids need to be paying attention today uh, to be prepared because this is gonna be, like the, some kids don't even know a life without cell phones. There's kids who don't know a life without space. And, um, and so I think uh, for, for their benefit, because we are leaving this to them, uh, they should be tuning in. My, my primary message to teachers and parents is that instill upon your children that if they have the will and the persistence, they can achieve anything they want in life. Um, as, a, as a very short individual who aspired to be a military aviator who was a female, no one in my entire life told me I couldn't do that. And of course, when I started to say that, I literally wanted to fly from the time I could walk. So this was in the early 60s. My dad and my teachers never once told me, you can't do that. Little girls don't grow up to be military aviators. And so nobody squelched that desire and that dream in me. And I would say, no matter how far reaching your children may dream, you know, support them to the best of your ability. Yeah, and I think one of the other things we can do, and, and this is for teachers as well and parents, is give them a, a low cost opportunity to almost touch space. And when I went and looked at Sputnik, it was only 23 inches in diameter. People don't realize how small it was and uh, that you could tune your radio to hear it beep and actually watch it go across the sky. But we have many Americans that don't realize you can see the International Space Station. I still talk to schools and, and I remember a conversation at a very large school in which the teacher said that they didn't talk about the space station because they didn't have a telescope to see it. And so they were quite surprised when I showed them the app and uh, that you, you could actually capture the imagination of students by being able to predict when this light was gonna come over the horizon, the angle, the time, and how long it was going to transit the sky. And that my 93 year old mother also looks up those sightings and she calls all the neighbors. She even calls me even though she's two time zones away. So I don't see it at the same time. <laughs> but 
<laughs> but those are exciting moments. And then you can say there are six people on that station and you can go to the internet and see who they are and they're people just like they are. But you know, one of the incredible things about where we are today is you know, you can look out at a classroom and say any one of you is gonna have an opportunity to fly in space, whether you're an astronaut or not. Mm -hmm. Any one of you will have an opportunity to work on spacecraft. There are kids in middle schools today building satellites that are flying in space. It's just, it's an incredible moment to actually bring the magic of space into classrooms. Absolutely, you know, even on the shuttle, we had middle school students uh, flying experiments and that opportunity to connect with them was transformative because I have some of them now at the university. So uh, we know it works. There you have it, right. <laughs> You know, we've, we've just spent some time talking about Space Station. It's celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. And Bonnie, I love your stories about how you can see Space Station from wherever, wherever you are on the planet using that app. Uh, but there's some big milestones coming up just this month with Space Station and how we have access to it. Tracy, can you talk, us, talk a little to us about the Commercial Crew Program and how we'll be launching Americans from Florida later this month? Yeah, the, this is... Um... Uh, the final countdown to uh, one of our uh, one of two commercial crew vehicles. Um, we're still in the test phase, uh, but at the end of this month, hopefully, we will launch uh, Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley on uh, the SpaceX uh, DM2 uh, SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon, and um, we're waiting for uh, the the sister flight, the Boeing uh, flight uh, CFT, uh, to launch crew on board that all to dock to the International Space Station. And this is so that we can uh, open up space to our commercial partners and prove their capability and support them in their quest to understand that environment and to thrive in it. And so this is a really exciting time for so many reasons, um, not the least of which is the fact that we're getting back to launching American-made vehicles um, from American soil. And though uh, it has been a real blessing to um, have been a part of the Russian uh, space program and, and the honor of launching on uh, their vehicle and uh, living uh, on board the space station with our international partners. Uh, there's something about, um, you know, the, so that the American, <laughs> the American people that, that support uh, this program can uh, see the hard work uh, that their, their support, their money goes to in terms of uh, uh, the support that they give to NASA and to be able to launch from this country again will just um, make them uh, a gr make them feel a greater participation in this. And so, uh, this um, this flight coming up, uh, our commercial crew program is uh, going to spark a lot of um, interest and and motivation uh, just to renew uh, something that we started a long time ago and uh, to continue it. Um, and then beyond that. Um, we're, uh, we're hoping that that will become our new way to get to the International Space Station, another very miraculous uh, engineering feat uh, that um, was built in the vacuum of space. And um, astronauts for, for decades have been a part of building that. And it's um, an exciting thing to be a part of and that we can combine the commercial crew program with uh, something as steadfast as the International Space Station is, I think, a, a great way to transition to the next phase of space exploration. I am so incredibly excited to see an American spacecraft launch from a U.S. launch site. Um, it's been a long time. It's been obviously much longer than any of us. Uh, when I say any of us, I still assimilate myself with a big NASA family. Uh, any of us might have thought when we retired the space shuttle. Um, and so I am incredibly excited about this opportunity, and, and I think it's long past due. Now, I think it's exciting that we're going to be um, launching back again off our soil. It's not only an inspiration to a generation that's actually not seen uh, launches, uh, but it's also an investment in a skill set in the workforce that we're going to need for the future. It's not easy to launch people into space or to build the rockets to do it. And we need a whole new generation of rocket engineers. Talk about the importance of teamwork on the space station and how you can bring that into the classroom. You know, the space station is all about being a team. It's interesting that you go from uh, the, the. Let me just set the stage when you're when you're training for a shuttle flight. 
you are one uh, member of a seven person crew and you train all together. And that was my first flight experience. And then when I became an expedition crew member, I trained primarily by myself. I was the single uh, US crew member um, flying on a rocket with two other Russian cosmonauts. And I traveled all around the world and, and my schedule was, was really just about me getting to places. And so it was quite different. Um, and one would think just based off of that, that there wasn't much team in the, in the space station. However, uh, when you think about the space station from uh, the crew size that, you know, you're still a crew of three, and then you get to the space station and you meet another crew of three and you become a crew of six. And then if you had visiting vehicles coming, which we did at the time, you would have a shuttle of seven, six to seven other crew members. So you could be up to 12, 13 people on the space station. And uh, you're, you're having to assemble yourself as a team and, and teams within a team. Um, and if that wasn't enough, then you, you've got a team on the ground. And the team on the ground is is controlling the vehicle, and you're having to coordinate with them. And not only the people who uh, operate the space station, but also all the scientists that are um, pr conducting experiments that you're a part of now. And it's not just um, in one location on on the Earth; it's all around the globe. I mean, it's the planet. And so the the team just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as we move forward um, into space you know, it's going to uh, take um, a larger team than that. And today we're, we're commercial partners, we're international partners, we're industry partners, we're academic partners. Uh, it's all about the team. And there is no way a single entity can get to space and do what we can do today if it were um, just up to a, a single group. It takes a community, it takes a team. And so teamwork, um, I, I don't know that I, I had ever realized um, the importance of, of teamwork more than when I was on the space station. And I wouldn't have guessed that going into my training as I was traveling by myself, but it's made a huge impression on me, Andy. So Bonnie, one of the things that, that I've noticed, you know, teaching at the university level is employers are really looking for students that have some experience doing teamwork in the classroom on projects. What are some of the things that we can do to bring more of that into the class? Well, you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, part of uh, the ABIT accreditation for engineering is uh, by the senior year, we want them working on teams, design teams. And what I do is I, I draw on my own history. I, I went to work for Rockwell as an engineer building the space shuttle, and that was my first experience as teams. It all has to come together. I came to NASA in mission control and was part of the Skylab reentry team and then was selected as an astronaut. And as Tracy said, you have to be part little teams in big teams and, and you don't accomplish these big goals without being a team player. So now that I have graduate students, I remind them that this senior design course they had was not just a course to get a grade. And so I, I treat my lab as a team. I make them work together, they share data together, and try to incorporate those lessons so that when I turn them back out into academia or industry, and they're my students, they already know how to be part of a team. And they will be successful as a team member as they learn those skills. You know, the, the ultimate teamwork is on a space mission where literally your life depends on your teammates and their life depends on you. And, and I think when you come out of that environment, uh, even if you go into a classroom where there's, there's no threat to, to human existence really in a classroom, um, the, the more you can extend those same traits and, and impress upon students the necessity to learn how to work uh, with students from other cultures and how to respect the language and the cultural differences, let alone the academic background differences, uh, the better off we'll all be. Because it's going to take a large team on the ground and in space uh, to explore beyond low Earth orbit. And just going back to the original shuttle uh, classes, the uh, 78 class 80 on, uh, one of the selection criteria was uh, having a demonstrated ability to be a team member. They'd all ask us all what sports we played. And in fact, we had an astronaut softball team. Uh, because we knew we were going to have larger crews, uh, we had pilots coming in who had been single-seater pilots. We'd had mission specialists that did 
been in labs and never worked as part of a team. So not only did they look for team attributes, and sports was one of them, but also they created teams. Our astronaut classes uh, were together for at least a year participating in common events. And so I, I pass that on to my graduate students because you're always asked, well, you know, what are the requirements to be an astronaut? And it's not just the academics, it's the, the other soft skills, such as being a, a team player. And as Tracy brought up earlier, you know, it's important to be more well-rounded. Um, I also played uh, sports and took languages, and I impress upon my students that communication, social skills, team playing, those are all uh, part of the whole package in uh, being a very successful, not just an astronaut, but scientist or engineer. You know, as we wrap up today, I just want to give a chance to Tracy, Nancy, and Bonnie, just what's one thing you wish educators knew as we wrap up today? Well, speaking uh, for myself, the thing that made the difference for me, uh, my favorite professor, uh, my first year of college, um, asked me hard questions and then taught me how to think, and it was his job uh, to help me answer it. And I think for the educators out there, if you realize that you are you're shaping a mind and to share yours with them is uh, one of the most powerful things that you can do uh, for any, any uh, moldable young mind out there. Well, I think I'd first of all, thank anyone who decided to be an educator to be an educator. Uh, my sister uh, was a K-12 educator and I'll just share a story about her. When I was with NASA, she found two ways of uh, inspiring your students, uh, especially the younger ones. One was through space pictures and the others was through dinosaurs. But I supplied her with all the space uh, pictures and she found that in, in very uh, incentivizing and inspiring to her students. So space is still there, it's the future. And I think we need to find ways to connect our young people and help our teachers to do that. I think the first thing they can do is to, you know, try to ignite that passion. So. If that passion is space, try to get them engaged as, as much as they can. The, the second fundamental thing, I think, is that role models play, play a critical uh, aspect in, in a child's aspirations. And the more the child can look at somebody that looks like them and talks like them and maybe comes from their home state or their hometown or their home country, the more realistic their goals become. I call it the NASA geographical rule. If you were to ask a lot of kids in the Houston area, do you want to be an astronaut? They'd say yes, and that they think it's totally feasible. And the farther away you get sort of geographically from the hub of, of human space flight, the more abstract that goal becomes. So the more that they can make that goal appear to be realistic and inspire the children and inspire and ignite that passion because with will and passion, th there's nothing they can't achieve. So Mike, I, I wanna thank you. Um, I wanna thank all the educators that are out there making a difference every day and, and working so incredibly hard under difficult circumstances. My message to the educators out there is, is space is there, space is there for you to use. I think um, we've learned that today. I also wanna give a shout out to, to um, Public Consulting Group who has been a tremendous supporter of everything we're trying to do here. And um, Mike, I think I'm gonna to toss it to you for the last comments here. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for joining from home, wherever you might be. Thank you to my fellow panelists. And let's close today by talking about the Artemis generation and knowing that we truly are going 50 years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. 
For this, we design an entirely new rocket. The Space Launch System. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and to stay, to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going.